Some good buzzwords in this one. So uh, the intersection of metaverse AI and mental health. So you've, you've got, some, got some good buzzwords in there. So we have uh, um, Tessie Lieberman uh, from Styrex Studios. Masal Hair. How is everyone? It's great to be here. It's my first time in Dubai. And uh, let's check that this is actually working. I'm playing with the microphones. Feeling like a rock star here. So it's great to see all of you here. And today, we're going to be speaking about the intersection of AI, metaverse, and mental health. And let's get going. What is it? Oh, this is probably, is this like, no? This is the wrong direction. Yeah? OK, great. So I'm Sachi Lieberman. I'm based in Israel. I'm the co-founder of Starx Studios, a studio, a game studio that is based in Halifax, Canada. Uh, I've been in the industry for quite some time, over 20 years, um, and been in blockchain and Web3 from 2014. It was a, a very adventurous road, I might say. But I wanted to start with one of my favorites. I'm a big Rick and Morty fan, and for me, um, Rick and Morty were always representations of a very colorful characters. And what I always noticed is that they are so full of anxiety and stress, and they have so many different, you know, um, personalities. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. So just like Morty, uh, in in that in that TV series, virtual worlds inhabitants or virtual world players have many different facets of the same personality, and. Eventually, they have different usage for the same game, different playing styles. We can remember Bartel 35 years ago, speaking about the collector, the killer, the, the socializer, and so forth. And there are many other differentiations, like Navic, uh, speaking about the different playing styles for the blockchain world. Um, how is this actually affecting us when we are designing a gaming world in terms of stress, in terms of anxiety, in terms of depression, right? How do we design those worlds when we support not just the playability, but also the mental health of those players? Um, so a very recent report in the US by the head healthcare uh, ministry have shown a very concerning data. And maybe I'll, I'll just pick this one because this is Working? Is it working? Great. Okay. This is, this is better. So when we look on the data, that is very concerning because we see all the, you know, uh, it's, it's actually an epidemic of loneliness and isolation in terms of social connectability, right? If we look on the different aspects of social isolation or so, my social engagement with the different friends I have, even family members, or my camaraderie in those specific virtual worlds, we see that declining in many different, at least you know, 20 percent, and some of them even more. So that's very concerning in terms of date, that data. And of course, mental health is affecting physical situation, my physical health, right? So we can see a striking data here that lacking social connection is affecting my health even more than smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. That's insane. Or even more than drinking six alcohol drinks a day. And of course, when we are speaking about the social connection influence on my health, it consists out of many different components, right? Psychology-wise, right? It affects my stress levels, my safety levels, right? My hopefulness, I'm not feeling hopeful. My biology, right? I, I'm releasing more stress hormones. I feel insecure. And my behavior, I'm smoking more, I'm sleeping less. And that we can see also in the virtual world when it's designed in a very wrong way, right? And the structure for that is also um, consists out of three components, right? My, uh, do I have the emotional support in that virtual world? Do I have that mentorship? Do I have those components that are monitoring me or supporting me in my connectivity to others? 
And of course, all of those are striking data that we need to consider. But let's grab a little bit of a history lesson. When we look at technology, there were always those who said, we need to fight it. It's going to hold out our progress as human beings. It's going to take out work, workplaces. And we can start with the Luddites. In the 19th century, the Luddites were a bunch of textile workers in England that said, hey, we are against those machines. We, they went to factories and they actually broken up machines. They said, this is going to stop progress for us. Um, and then on the 19th century, when electricity came, electricity was the devil. You can see on the right a poster that is showcasing the dangers of using electricity. That is going to be disastrous for the humankind. And on the left side, we can see another 19th century poster about vaccinations. Why do we need to cope with medicine, right? Why do we need medicine even? We can cope with that ourselves. Medicine is poison. So there were always those who were trying to say progress for us is not actually a progress. It will change evolution. And we can see the same case with AI. Just this protest by, or, or this you know, collection of signature by Elon Musk and others, where AI is a danger to evolution. But today, we can create so much with AI. We can generate thousands of AI characters, game assets on the fly, right? We can see that in many different, many different games. We can use ChatGPT to create content. And we can even, and that was discussed before, we can use companies like InWorld or others just to create those effective, human-oriented human or empathic game characters that we can speak to, right? And they can reply not as a walking billboard, but I can actually feel that I'm part of the gaming world. And of course, that saves quite a lot of time, budgets, and empower everyone, right, with that shiny toolbox that we can create more and more content and create games ourselves. So currently we are in a phase where we can, even if we are not professionals, if we are, if we are not artists, if we, are, if we are lacking the coding skills, we can use any of those, you know, game engines. We can use Buildbox, we can use Core, we can use the UFVN for Fortnite to create those gaming surroundings. And when you look at the metaverses, and it was discussed before me by Fernando, you would see many different metaverses out there. And if, if you can go to the list of metaverses, you would see hundreds of them, not just the main one, which is Sandbox or Decentraland or Spatial. Of course, there, was, there were so many in the history, right? Second Life was here 20 years ago. And you could draw money. You can go to an ATM in Second Life and get cash. You can start a business in Second Life. So what's different, right? We see so many metaverses nowadays, and the problem is that most of them are empty. When you're speaking about 100 players playing a metaverse, why is that? Is it because they are just, we have just plenty of those? Or something in the design or the purpose, right, of the game world is problematic? Um, so are we, are we on the path to create fun, health-oriented experiences? I'm not sure about that. So I want to summarize uh, my talk. I don't know, Ooh, I have 10 minutes, that's good. Um, I want to summarize my talk by five key takeaways in order for us to develop or create or design a mental, healthy gaming world. So the first one is foster positive relationships. And we spoke about AI characters. We need to create AI characters that are supportive, that are positive for our relationship with the world, that are encouraging us to do more and create those different relationships with our comrades, but also you know, be, uh, feel like we are having that sense of belonging. And if we look on the data, we can see, of course, for many years, the the attitude of players towards NPCs is that they always want that interaction to be more reasonable. 
Because what we mostly do when we play a game and we went and we go to an NPC, we go forward two steps and back one step. And we always try to find the right path to get the right answer. But that is not a quiz. That is not how real conversation are taken care of. So for players and for gamers, we are interested in that realism, in that sense of having a real conversation with a game character that support us, but also a game character that is there for us, is there to encourage us when we are down and understand when we are going a path which is a little bit negative in terms of the game play. Um, and I highly recommend that, um, that talk from GDC about the lives of others. So how do you design or how do you create NPCs that can increase or can support player empathy? Um, the second one is mindfulness. And a couple of, the, couple of people here already asked me about how do you combine those in a game, right? We, we uh, see or meet so many players which are stressed out and you feel when you're interacting with them, of course not during a PvP match, but when you are just role playing and we, you are speaking to them, you feel something is wrong. They are either tired, they are either annoyed by something, but eventually everything adds up and games are supposed to be our escape from some of our real life situations. And for that, I would say, let's try to combine or embed some relaxation techniques or some mindfulness uh, techniques into the gameplay. And it's not easy. I didn't see many games who do that, but I did see many games that are dedicated, or a couple of games that are dedicated to that. So Helium, uh, it's, on, it's on Oculus um, and other platforms, and you can start a meditation or a mindfulness activities there, and, and highly successful. And Allo, it's also an interesting, uh, an interesting platform which, is, which helps you create your own metaverse space, but also have that yoga, online yoga meditation sessions over there to relax and then go back to your normal uh, playing uh, activities. Uh, the third one is reward positive behaviors. If we see players that are not just toxic in the game, or not just playing the game, but also helping others, supporting others, promote that connection, creating a relationship in that gaming world, I would love games to notice that and reward them for being just great players, but great human beings in promoting that community and supporting them while they are play. And that could be in character or out of character. And um, we can see the case by League of Legends. So Riot initiated the three skins um, initiative where you can, they, they uh, designed a specialized, unpurchasable set of skins that you can uh, gain if you are recommended by players that you're a good supporting player for your comrades, for the objectives in the game. Uh, but also if you are reviewed by other players, if you are completing quests which are related only to that, and they pave the whole path for unlocking that. So you cannot buy that, but you can gain that. And you can see, you know, few of those players while you play, and that is like a, the honor system for them. So uh, it's highly coveted, and players are trying to do that. So convincing them, yes, it's extrinsic reward, but in a way, you are internally encouraged to do more. Um, so that's, that's a good example. Four is, um, if we already have AI mechanisms, if we already have uh, AI plugins, why won't we use them to detect which of our players is at risk? We can identify those toxic or negative or, or you know, declining behaviors that we can collect that data, of course, in depend, depending on privacy, and then offer a solution. The solution could be out of the gaming world, right? Support in terms of therapy, or we can have a dedicated AI companion while we play that can be a character completely. And that character can kick in when it feels like, hey, dude, you are on a slippery slope and I want to support you with that. And that text, that dialogue or that support can be 
in character that could be in that game world uh, theme. Um, so we, we have the checklist, we know what point we need to follow and track. Of course, this is a very you know, low level detection, but that can be supported by real therapists in and outside of the game. And there's an Israeli company that is working on something like that, which is AI companion that is trying to track behaviors and they are teaming with different hospitals around the world. So it's really interesting to see that in action and how many people they can save. And the fifth one is promote physical activity. We've seen early in the day, uh, speaking about step-in, for example, right? So we know that physical activity, when you're into uh, depression or loneliness or anxiety, it releases, it releases hormones that helps you feel more happy more fulfilled, more satisfied, more powerful, and we need that in the game. So not every game is suitable for that. I've seen many games which are on AR when they track your physical steps or activities. We have those on VR, but you can also create an app that is complementing your game, which is on PC, that helps you walk more, do more physical activity, run, like zombie run game, and collect those points and cash them in, right? So promote that, be healthier using physical activity, and those examples can be from, you know, step in, which we already know that you are getting points, collecting points, cashing them, having those specialized shoes, <coughs> sorry, through genopets that you're fighting monsters or creating your monsters through your steps and fitness activities, through Dustland, which is a run, uh, it's, it's a move to earn runner, uh, which is, I think it's in development currently, to others like boxing activities that are available on VR. So I think the combination of the mix of physical activities with playing a digital games while sitting, that's uh, contributing to your mental health and your physical health. Um, and that's it, folks. One minute before the end. That's nice. Do we have any questions? Good job. Yes. Do we have any questions? Anyone? Don't be shy. I'll, I'll, I'll have to ask a question. Okay. Um, no, that was, that was really interesting. I guess you're, um, you know, you're throwing together some some views that you have about how this kind of stuff should play out. Uh, you know, are you are you? You had the example of uh, League of Legends, but in general, are you seeing this being something that developers are interested in, or is this going to be sort of, you know, quite a a sort of slow burn to get these sort of aspects? And obviously, obviously, not necessarily not all aspects will go into all games, but you know, I would say at the moment most developers are not thinking about this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, right, right. So, um, of course, naturally, it depends on the nature of the game. In highly competitive games, you would find sometimes many toxic communities. I was a Dota player, professional player for many years, and I've met one of the toxic communities out there. And when you see those players, which are not bad personas in, in, in terms of their being human beings, um, you would see that high level of competition that is also contributing to the tox toxicity of the conversation and how they treat other players other treat other genders, and for me, I, we've seen the, the, the case of Riot, which was initiated by them. It was their idea, not the community idea, because they wanted to showcase how we deal or how we promote um, you know, diversity, but also inclusiveness and supporting that community. But yeah, I, I bet that other companies will follow, and I've seen a couple of developments that are out there, so hopefully that will happen and we'll see more of that. Okay, Thank good. you for that. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>